Section 1 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melanie Schleter McCalmont, Madison, Wisconsin, on the web at melanie.mcalmont.org. Dot org. Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. Section 1. John Wesley Powell. John Wesley Powell was in more senses than one a scientific frontiersman. His life reveals the energetic working of a vigorous and independent personality not trammeled by traditional methods and not so deeply versed in the history, the content, and the technique of the sciences as to be guided by them, but impelled to the rapid discovery of new principles by the inspiration of previously unexplored surroundings. His life shows us further how a man of exceptional power rises suddenly in an otherwise undistinguished lineage and how he surmounts the limiting associations of early years less through the opportunity provided by others than through opportunities opened by his own individual enterprise for the satisfaction of inborn interests. Early Life Powell, the fourth of nine children, was born of English parents at Mount Morris in the Genesee Valley of western New York on March 24th 1834. His father, Joseph Powell, a Methodist preacher, and his mother, Mary Dean Powell, had come to the United States a short time before. The family moved from New York to Jackson, Ohio, in 1838-39, to South Grove, Wisconsin, in 1846, and eventually to Illinois, settling first at Bonus Prairie in 1851, and later at Wheaton in 1854. Thus, in Illinois, Powell lived from his 17th to his 27th year. While he was still a boy in Ohio, he had experience of anti-slavery agitation. His father was a staunch abolitionist, who did not conceal his opinions, and as a result the son was so unfairly treated by his mates in the village school that he was removed from it, and for a time put under the care of a well-to-do elderly neighbor named Crookham, who taught gratuitously and irregularly in a log house school and laboratory, as well as in the field. It was thus that young Powell made a beginning in scientific study and observation. When the move was made from Ohio, all the household goods were transported in a wagon and two carriages, one of the latter being driven by young John to Wisconsin. There the boy, when his father was away from home preaching, had the duty of conducting the farm, from which the family derived its principal support, and of hauling farm produce to markets, five or six days to a trip, and twelve or more trips in a year. But his heart was in his studies, and in the winter of 1850 he went to Janesville, twenty miles from home, to attend school, working for his keep on a nearby farm. In 1852, he began school teaching, with half his pupils older than himself, and for the following nine years he alternately taught, studied, and traveled. He had the good fortune at the outset of this laborious period to fall in with intelligent school officials, but much of his teaching was done under narrowing conditions of isolation and privation. His college studies were varied. They were pursued at Illinois College, Jacksonville, 1855 to 1856, at Oberlin College, Ohio, 1858, where he studied chiefly botany, Latin, and Greek, and at Wheaton College in 1858. Powell was a naturalist at that time, fond of roaming, observing, and collecting. He had joined the State Society of Natural History in 1854, and in making an extensive collection of mollusca, he crossed most of the prairie states. 
In 1856 he traveled, a young fellow of twenty-two, alone in his boat on the Mississippi. The next year he descended the Ohio, and the year after he followed the Illinois and Des Moines rivers. His collections brought him into relation with various colleges. He became secretary of the Illinois Society of Natural History, and his friends of that time found him an entertaining narrator, full of enthusiasm, humor, and philosophy. End of section one. Section two of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Service in the Civil War. Powell's studies and travels were interrupted by the outbreak of the Civil War. A visit to the South on a lecturing tour in 1860, where he closely studied the sentiment of the people regarding slavery, had persuaded him that nothing short of war could settle the matter. When war came, he promptly enlisted as a private in the 20th Illinois Infantry on May 8, 1861, quote, with the avowed purpose of doing his part in the extinction of slavery in this country, and from the first day after the call was made for troops, he felt thoroughly convinced that American slavery was doomed. Unquote. He went to the front as sergeant major, but was soon commissioned second lieutenant. His knowledge of engineering led him into such work as building roads and bridges and planning camps and entrenchments. In the winter of 1861-1862, he recruited a company of artillery of which he was commissioned captain. A brief leave of absence in March 1862 allowed him a hurried visit to Detroit, where with only two hours' delay he married his cousin, Miss Emma Dean, to whom he had been long engaged. She returned with him at once to the field and cared for him not long afterward when he was wounded in the Battle of Shiloh on April 6, 1862. At the moment when he gave a signal to fire by raising his right arm, a rifle ball struck his wrist and glanced toward the elbow. The hasty care at first given to the wound was followed by an operation which left him with a mere stump below the elbow, from which he suffered pain for many years. He was incapacitated at the time for several months, but he later had nearly three more years of active service, during which he was frequently in close relations with General Grant and was commissioned as Major of Artillery. When finally detailed to act as Chief of Artillery, he had sixteen batteries under his command. Among the busiest days of his life were the thirty or more prior to the fall of Vicksburg in March 1864, in part because in addition to his military duties, he collected fossils from the trenches. He was honorably discharged January 14, 1865, and, refusing higher rank than offered, was known as the Major thereafter. The wound in his arm gave him much pain at various later periods and weakened an exceptionally strong constitution. Not until a few years before his death was he fully relieved by a successful operation on the terminating nerves. Some years after the war, he met a Confederate officer, Colonel C. E. Hooker, who had lost his left arm at Shiloh. The two officers became friends, and when either one in later years bought a pair of gloves, he sent the unused glove to his former enemy. There can be little question that a school teacher of scientific bent, a lone rambler over prairies, a solitary voyager on long rivers, doing his own work as boatman and collector of natural history specimens, learned much from the responsibilities placed upon him during four years of soldier's life in the way of reaching prompt decision, giving authoritative command, delegating work to others, and securing loyal obedience from his subordinates. It does not follow that the decisions reached were always the wisest possible, still they were the best available, and action had to be taken on them without hesitating deliberation. But Powell hated war, 
in spite of his willing service while war lasted. Fighting to him was an uncivilized method of dealing with the problems of civilization. He must, as an officer, have developed many qualities that stood him in good stead as an organizer and administrator in later years, yet it may be well asked whether his faithful perseverance under adverse conditions during nine previous years of study and teaching in a time of peace were not equally decisive in developing his capacity to carry through whatever he undertook. End of section two. Section three of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section three, Visit to the Rocky Mountains, 1867 to 1868. The war over, Powell returned to his home in Illinois and was nominated clerk of DuPage County, Illinois, at a good salary, but at the same time he was offered an appointment more to his liking, though at a lower salary, as professor of geology in Illinois Wesleyan College at Bloomington. This he accepted. A later appointment was that of lecturer and curator at the museum at the Illinois Normal University at Normal near Bloomington. The young professor took his classes into the field, had an active part in public discussions in favor of introducing more science in college programs, and influenced the state legislature to advance science teaching in the normal university. In the summer of 1867, Powell, at the age of 33, struck out on a new path that led to all his later work. Aided by the Illinois Society of Natural History, with which he was still connected, he conducted a party of 16 naturalists, students, and amateurs across the plains to the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, then known more as a field for adventure than for research. His wife accompanied him. Through the aid of General Grant, it was arranged that the Army posts should furnish his party with supplies at government rates. Railroads gave him passes. A contemplated passage through the Badlands under military escort was given up on account of hostile Indians. The expedition visited South and Middle Parks, climbed Pikes Peak and other mountains, and gathered a great store of specimens that were shipped back to the colleges at Bloomington, Normal, and elsewhere. Powell was thus the first college professor to combine field teaching with Western exploration, and this enterprise deservedly opened his larger scientific career. He remained in the mountains for a time after his students went home, and in the following winter published a preliminary report, a small affair of four pages, addressed to the Illinois State Board of Education and signed as curator of the Illinois Natural History Society. The only known copy is in the library of the United States Geological Survey. He returned to Colorado with another party in the summer of 1868, this time with aid from certain colleges in Illinois and from the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, and again with authority for getting provisions from military posts. He passed the summer in the region of Middle Park. The following winter, Mrs. Powell still being in the party, was spent in camp in the valley of White River, a branch of Green River, in western Colorado and eastern Utah. From this camp, Powell made excursions to the Grand, Green, and Yampa rivers. While thereabouts, he made his first studies of Indian tribes and became an ethnologist. There is no indication that he had had earlier training in ethnology, and it may well be believed that it was as largely his warm sympathy as his keen inquiry that led him to eminent success in this field. But the more immediate result of this summer and winter, regarding which no report was published, was his plan for the exploration of the green Colorado River by following its course in boats. Perhaps his previous experience on the placid rivers of the prairies 
led to this adventurous project on a torrential river deeply enclosed in unknown canyons. End of section three. Section four of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 4. Exploration of the Colorado Canyon It was truly a daring project. Professor Brewer of Yale wrote of it some years later, in effect as follows. Being in Colorado while Powell was making his trip down the river, I was intensely anxious as to his fate, for I thought his project a mad scheme. The river has an average fall of 10 or 15 feet per mile, and I had assumed that there must be great falls or that the explorer must approach them from above. On telling Powell of this some years later, he answered in substance, Have you never seen the river? It is the muddiest river you ever saw. Rapids I expected, of course, but not falls. I was convinced that the canyon was old enough and the muddy water swift enough and gritty enough to have worn down all falls to mere rapids. I entered the canyon with confidence that I would have no high falls to stop us, although there might be bad rapids, and I believed that we might overcome them in some way, and we did. The most significant words in this statement are old enough, for they show that even before Powell had explored the Colorado, he had somehow come to understand that a large muddy river must rapidly acquire a graded course, even though at the bottom of a deep canyon still enclosed by high walls. Powell returned from the west by rail to Chicago in the spring of 1869 to get boats for the expedition. It was organized as a geographical and geological survey, supported by an appropriation from Congress, and placed under the direction of the Smithsonian Institution, of which the then Secretary, Joseph Henry, advised that the collection of ethnological data should be made a leading feature of the journey. The party consisted of ten men. They embarked May 24, 1869, in four boats, where the Union Pacific Railroad crosses the Green River in southwestern Wyoming, followed Green River through deep gorges in the Uinta Mountains to its junction in open country with the Grand River, below which point the name Colorado is given, then continued down the Colorado through its profound canyons in the plateaus of southeastern Utah and northern Arizona to the open country near the Nevada line on August 29th. Singularly enough, no sufficient account of this adventurous journey was published until several years afterward, although it attracted much notice at the time. A few brief summaries regarding the canyon and the adjacent region are buried in the congressional documents of the early 70s but Powell did not at first intend to publish any full report of what he had done and seen. His famous volume, Exploration of the Colorado River of the West, 1875, one of the best narratives of adventure anywhere to be found, was not written until four or five years after the event, and then only on the insistence of Representative, later President, Garfield as Powell tells in 1895 in the preface to his popular book, The Canyons of the Colorado. In addition to his report of 1875, several articles were contributed to Popular Science Monthly and to Scribner's Magazine for that year. The Country Traversed was of exceptional interest and his articles awakened widespread attention. His official report treated the journey in a singularly free and unconventional manner, for Powell reproduced his original diary, keeping the narrative in the present tense as when written in the canyon, with the result of giving a vivacity to his story unusual in government publications, yet one may read it without learning that the author had lost his right forearm. The climax of the journey is reached when, 
after the party had made nearly all the dangerous distance in a little less than three months, three of the men insist that further progress is too perilous and that the river must be abandoned. They seek a way out by climbing up to the plateau surface. The others persist in following the river, and that very afternoon come upon a group of the most dangerous falls in the whole journey. It is interesting to note that these falls do not constitute an exception to Powell's expectation that the river must have already graded its course in the uplifted rocks of the plateaus, for the obstruction which here caused the falls was formed in an exceptional manner by flows of lava that had, in altogether unpredictable fashion, cascaded down from the volcanoes of the Uinkaret Plateau on the north so recently that they have not yet been cleared away by the river. As these falls are approached from upstream, there is no possibility of seeing their face and choosing the least dangerous point for descent. The walls are too steep for a portage along the bank, so one of the men, Bradley, approaches the brink of the fall in a boat held by a tow line from the cliffs. The current soon becomes so strong that the boat cannot be drawn back. Bradley promptly cuts the line and plunges over the falls, whirling in waves and foam, sinking out of sight, rising again, safe on board and waving his hat. Powell then tells his own manner of descent with two of his men. Quote, we run to the other boat, jump aboard, push out, and away we go over the falls. A wave rolls over us, and our boat is unmanageable. Another great wave strikes us. The boat rolls over and tumbles and tosses. I know not how. All I know is that Bradley is picking us up. We soon have all right again and row to the cliff and wait until Sumner and W. H. Powell can come along the wall. After a difficult climb, they reach us. We run two or three miles farther and turn again to the northwest, continuing until night, when we have run out of the granite once more. End quote. An early start is made the next morning. Quote, the river still continues swift, but we have no serious difficulty, and at twelve o'clock emerge from the Grand Canyon of the Colorado. End quote. Thus simply, it is told that on August 29th, three months after the start from Green River, the party victoriously passes out of the deep canyon into the open country of the Great Basin. Some of the men go on down the river. Powell went northward through Mormon settlements to Salt Lake City and thence home. He had been preceded by reports of disaster and had the pleasure of reading a number of obituary notices of his life. The good fortune of this daring journey was deservedly of great service to its chief. It developed his capacity for leadership in the field. It received much attention in the newspapers of the time, and thus gave its head a national reputation as a bold, adventurous, successful explorer. Best of all, it secured the full confidence of men at Washington who could aid his further work. When in later years of exploration the men of his party gathered around the campfire and the major talked to them of his passage through the Great Canyon, his influence over all his hearers was so profound that in the days that followed a word from him was sufficient to cause the men to go anywhere or to do anything, no matter what the personal danger might be. And this is no wonder, for he was loyally devoted to his men. Of his companions through the canyon, he wrote years afterward, I was a maimed man, my right arm was gone, and these brave men, these good men, never forgot it. End of section four. Section 5 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Geological Survey of the Territories Powell returned to Utah and Arizona in 1870, 
and explored the plateaus north of the canyon. A good account of this trip is given in Chapter 9 of The Report on the Colorado River of the West. In 1871, he again made a boat trip on The River. In 1874 and 75, he worked chiefly in eastern Utah. Of these three campaigns, there is unfortunately no narrative by Powell, but many of the results are summarized in a remarkable report on the geology of the eastern part of the Uinta Mountains, 1876, published as the work of the Second Division of the U.S. Geological and Geographical Survey of the Territories, of which he was then geologist in charge. His later western journeys, as well as those of the summers of 1872 and 1873, were chiefly occupied with ethnological studies, of which brief accounts are given in Congressional and Smithsonian reports. Powell prepared no other important geological volumes. The great impression that he made on American geology must be credited, apart from his later work as an administrator, to the two reports on the Colorado River and the Uinta Mountains. The popular book on the Canyons of the Colorado, Meadville, Pennsylvania, 1895, was prepared more than 20 years after the event and looks more like a publisher's than an author's venture. Several chapters on the native tribes were here included, but the whole appears to have been hastily put together with too many pictures little related to the text. Report on the Colorado Canyon Of the two reports, the earlier one on the Colorado is the more important. It is certainly one of the most famous books of exploration published in this country. It is unusually well illustrated, partly with woodcuts from photographs, partly with schematic drawings by Holmes, in some of which a foreground section showing geological structure and a perspective view showing surface form were admirably combined in the style of block diagrams. Powell himself seems to have had no graphic skill, and perhaps for that reason permitted the publication of certain exaggerated pictures, such as that of Horseshoe Canyon, opposite on page 162, drawn by Moran in a misleadingly realistic fashion and of a seriously incorrect picture opposite page 212, probably drawn from verbal description of the double unconformity at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, the interpretation of which has puzzled more than one reader, all the more because the excellence of the other illustrations gave reason for thinking that this one also must be trustworthy. The double unconformity is, however, correctly drawn in a geological section of the Uinta Mountains Report, page 43. Along with the other exploring geologists of that time, Powell enjoyed the inspiring opportunity of working in a new and extraordinary field where the problems were impressive in magnitude, yet relatively elementary in structure, and all plainly disclosed under the denuding influence of a dry climate. Facts which nature elsewhere held as her secrets were there openly proclaimed in imposing grandeur. Great series of deposits followed in orderly attitude in almost unbroken sequence. Deposition and denudation were measured in tens of thousands of feet. Unconformities were superbly exhibited. Deformation had not gone so far as to produce almost unsolvable complications, but had sufficed to cause great faults and flexures of simple pattern, and also to displace huge crustal blocks with only marginal disturbance, so that the structures of this kind in the Plateau province, first clearly set forth by Powell, became types for the world. The work demanded in detecting the geological history of the region was utterly unlike the detailed and technical investigation given year after year by European observers to the overthrusts of the highlands and the closed folds of the uplands of Scotland or to the overturns of the Alps. Minute studies were not called for in the plateau country. Conclusions were reached rapidly and large concepts were strongly impressed on the observer. 
It was therefore but natural that Powell's pathfinding geological work should be treated in a style and on a scale prompted by the simplicity and the magnitude of the great structural units with which he had to deal. Powell used fossils only as guides to the dates of stratified formations, not as a means of making out past forms of life. His volcanic studies were free from complicated nomenclature, guiltless of petrographical technique, and without bearing on the classification of igneous rocks, a subject that was then taking modern shape. He briefly saw and named the Henry Mountains during his canyon trip in 1869, and described them as composed of eruptive rocks in part, which had been poured out through some fissures here and spread over the country before it had been eroded to its present depth. Colorado River, page 177. But his curiosity must have been aroused as to what he did not see, for a few years later, he had a special study made there by Gilbert, whose famous report on the Henry Mountains was thus brought forth. Powell's inattention to the complex structures of crystalline rocks was shown by his usually giving the schists of the fundamental complex at the bottom of the Colorado Canyon the popular name of granite. He attended relatively little to the conditions under which ancient stratified deposits were accumulated and probably on this account did not free himself of the prepossessions regarding the lacustrine origin of the freshwater tertiaries, and did not offer any explanation of the extraordinary cross-bedding of the White Cliffs sandstone. But, regarding larger structures, he developed broad and bold generalizations that followed immediately from field observation and geological common sense, illumined by a free and lively imagination. He evidently enjoyed the systematization of his results and repeatedly reduced them to compact schematic form, from which irrelevant details and unknown local names were withheld, greatly to the advantage of his readers. His arguments were usually stated in a simple manner, free from technicalities, and his results were phrased in form for popular understanding. He was fully persuaded that his opinions were correct and not infrequently stated them in the positive form of inevitable conclusions, as most of them still seem to be. They carried conviction and are now accepted on nearly all points. Powell's unconscious style was simple and direct, as in the extract given above describing the end of his passage through the Colorado Canyon, or again in the famous paragraph cited below, regarding the origin of the Green River Canyon through the Uinta Mountains. On account of the loss of his right arm, he had to employ an amanuensis, and therefore acquired the time-saving capacity of dictating. His reports are astonishingly free from the prolixity that too often accompanies his method of composition, but they occasionally bear marks of insufficient revision in the retention of impromptu inventions like outthinnings, and in the use of certain words that might, to advantage, be replaced by others. It was perhaps not unnatural that his phraseology sometimes became exalted, as in the peroration of the Colorado River volume, where, as if recalling the excitement of the canyon journey, he wrote like an exuberant impressionist, quote, then again the restless sea retired, and the golden, purple, and black hosts of heaven made missiles of their own misty bodies, balls of hail, flakes of snow, and drops of rain, and when the storm of war came, the new rocks fled to the sea. End quote. Page 214. One of the most marked characteristics of Powell's reports is their freedom from citations of other authors. This was natural enough as far as the description of local features are concerned, for in the regions that he explored, he had few geological predecessors, and to those he gives full credit. His citations from the reports of the lamented Marvine are most generous, but in the statement of general schemes of mountain and volcanic structures and of stream and valley classification, the case is different. 
these subjects had been studied in europe also and the failure to give due credit to the work of foreign geologists in our survey reports brought upon us a certain measure of discredit abroad the reason for inattention to european studies evidently was that our geological frontiersmen found enough in the west to make up the whole of their science and besides they did not read french and german and they were so overwhelmed with work that they had no time to spend in looking up prior statements of their newly perceived principles so they overlooked foreign work in a continent-wide spirit of north american provincialism end of section five Section 6 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834-1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 6. Antecedent Rivers A significant instance of this kind is found in Powell's famous discussion of the course of the Green River through the Uinta Mountains. He wrote, quote, the river had the right of way. In other words, it was running ere the mountains were formed, not before the rocks, of which the mountains are composed, were deposited, but before the formations were folded, so as to make a mountain range. The emergence of the fold above the general surface of the country was little or no faster than the general progress of the corrasion of the channel. The river was the saw which cut the mountains in two. The summit of the fold slowly emerged, until the lower beds of sandstone were lifted to the altitude at first occupied by the upper beds, and if these upper beds had not been carried away, they would now be found more than 24,000 feet above the river. End quote. Colorado River Paper, 152 and 153. This is an admirable statement of a great idea. It bears not only upon the processes of river evolution, but upon the fundamental principles of geology. It is a welcome reinforcement of the arguments for uniformitarianism, which, though valiantly urged by Hutton, Playfair, and Lyell regarding processes of erosion and deposition, were even later than the middle of the 19th century not entirely successful in vanquishing the widespread traditional belief in violent processes of deformation and upheaval. Powell's demonstration, as he thought it, that the Uinta Mountains were not lifted up faster than the Green River could cut its canyon down through their broad anticline, had great influence in convincing his contemporaries that uplift, as well as erosion and deposition, is a slow process, and thus aided, the gentle doctrine of geological peace on earth gained a vast backward extension into periods of the past that had long been conceived as ages of violence. It was to rivers which, like the Green and the Uintas, had held their course through an area of adverse uplift that Powell gave the excellent name of antecedent. He appears to have made no search whatever to learn whether other observers had come upon the same idea, not that he was in the least disposed to claim priority by neglecting their labors, but that he was fully engrossed in his own. In a thorough review of this problem, Pink points out that Medlicott in India and Hayden in the United States had both preceded Powell in recognizing the persistence of certain rivers in holding their courses through slowly uplifted mountain ranges. Medlicott inferred the long persistence of certain rivers and the slow, imperceptible progress of deformation and uplift because of marked correspondence between the distribution of the accumulations of conglomerate ancient Piedmont river deposits, and the position of actual river gorges through the outer ranges of the Himalayas. Some of the upturned conglomerates are, quote, as thick and at as high angles as those on the Rigi in the Alps. The Sudle, in particular, is instanced as having held its course from a time before the outer or sub-Himalayan ranges were raised, 
After issuing from deep valleys and lofty inner ranges, it passes through low hills of soft rocks and then trenches a ridge formed of massive beds of coarse conglomerate of boulders such as only occur in the main river channels. These beds are now raised to the vertical, and in both directions along the strike, these conglomerates pass gradually within a few miles into the ordinary sandstones. The presumption from such a coincidence seems irrestible that the Sutle itself had deposited these banks of boulders at the spot where it still flows. Hayden's statement, based on studies in Montana, is as follows, quote, The fact that the streams seem to have cut their way directly through mountain ranges instead of following synclinal depressions indicates that they began the process of erosion at the time of the commencement of the elevation of the surface. This is shown all along the valley of the Yellowstone, and more conspicuously in the valleys of the Madison and Gallatin, which have carved immense canyons or gorges directly through two of the loftiest ranges of mountains in Montana. We believe that the course of these streams was marked out at or near the close of the Cretaceous period, and as the ranges of mountains were in process of elevation to their present height, the erosion of the channels continued. The details of the observations which contribute to form this opinion would occupy a chapter or two. End quote. Report of F. B. Hayden, 6th Report, U.S. Geological Survey of the Territories for 1872. Both of these authors, however, treated the problem of persistent rivers in an incidental manner, subordinating it to other larger topics. Neither of them gave an elaborate or an emphatic a statement to his theory, and neither of them invented a handy and suggested generic name for the kind of rivers that they explained. The taking term antecedent was a forcible supplement to the explanation of the profound idea involved in Powell's report, and this may be fairly taken to show that, notwithstanding the adverse opinion often inappropriately quoted to the contrary, from the emotional pleading of a charming heroine, there is really matter of much import in a name. But Powell's further argument in support of the antecedents of Green River through the Uinta Mountains includes, curiously enough, the case of certain streams which follow valleys excavated in belts of weak strata along the flanks of the range. Had the range been suddenly uplifted, these streams should, according to Powell, follow the dip of the strata. As they follow the strike instead of the dip, the uplift must have been gradual. Quote, the direction of the streams is indubitable evidence that the elevation of the fold was so slow as not to divert the streams. Had the fold been uplifted more rapidly, all the smaller streams and waterways should have been cataclinal. End quote, flowing down the dip. Hence, quote, the drainage was established antecedent to the corrugation or displacement of the beds by faulting and folding. End quote. Colorado River Paper 163. The same argument is used with respect to the drainage lines of the Arizona plateaus. Quote, all of the facts concerning the relation of the waterways of this region to the mountains, hills, canyons, and cliffs lead to the inevitable conclusion that the system of drainage was determined antecedent to the faulting and folding and erosion which are observed and antecedent also to the formation of the eruptive beds and cones. End quote. Yet the longitudinal valleys here referred to as so decisive in the discussion of antecedents, are apparently of the kind that had been explained ten years earlier, 1862, by Jukes from his studies of the Blackwater in southern Ireland, as having been slowly developed by headward or retrogressive erosion along the strike of weak beds. Thus interpreted, they indicate slow adjustment of streams to structures and probably do not bear on the problems of antecedents at all. This is not the place for further discussion of Green River, 
regarding which the theory of superposition, suggested by Emmons, merits consideration along with Powell's theory of antecedents. It indeed seems possible that Green River, which was described as a type of antecedent rivers when that term was introduced, may be otherwise explained, so that its place as type will be taken by a better proved example of antecedents, such as the Meuse in the Ardennes. This fate of a type is, however, not so very rare. The uplands of southern New England, described some twenty years ago as the type of an uplifted and dissected lowland of erosion, for which the name Peneplain was then suggested, may, like Green River, have to yield their place to a better proved example. The object in here, pointing out the invalidity of Powell's argument, is to show that even when a mind as original and powerful as his works in a field as inspiring as that of the Uinta Mountains, trenched by the canyon of the Green River, there is danger in overlooking, as Powell too often did, the work of earlier investigators on similar problems. It would be no more fitting to omit mention of this characteristic shortcoming of method from an account of Powell's work than to paint out a wrinkle in a true picture of his rugged and kindly face. But in any case, whether the Green River followed its present course antecedent to the uplift of the Uintas or not, and whether any other geologist preceded Powell in recognizing the occurrence elsewhere of rivers of this origin, it is distinctly to Powell that geology now owes the general acceptance of the idea of antecedents in river development. End of section 6. Section 7 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 7 Geological Work. Powell's contribution to geology, apart from the action of surface processes and the explanation of surface forms, related chiefly to large structural problems. He published many carefully studied columnar sections, giving indication of thickness, composition, and unconformities, and making provisional assignment of geological dates. But on the latter point, he wisely held that, quote, it would be manifestly absurd to introduce into a newly studied province the nomenclature which had been adopted in those provinces previously studied, end quote. Uinta, page 38. This principle guided him some years later when he pointed out in his first report as director of the United States Geological Survey that the introduction of local formation names has taken place in opposition to received opinions and in spite of the almost universal efforts of geologists to attain uniformity. It therefore represents the logical and necessary growth of the science. It seems especially unwise for the exploring geologist to commit himself in early stages of investigation to refine and exact correlations, and in practice it is found that a great number of local names are used tentatively until further research demonstrates approximate identity or establishes diversity. End quote. Powell was one of the pioneers in the demonstration of the almost undisturbed continuity of deposition in the West from the Cambrian to tertiary time, sometimes slightly interrupted by gentle unconformities, but without trace of the revolution that, from the structures known in Europe and eastern North America, had been previously supposed to mark a worldwide break between the depositional records of Paleozoic and Mesozoic times. He was the first to bring out the great structural features of the Plateau province, already referred to. He repeatedly emphasized the action of uplifting rather than of compressing forces, for he had chiefly to do with broad structures of nearly horizontal strata, limited by faults or, as he so justly remarks, their homologues, monoclinal flexures, and the latter style of deformation was in his time a geological novelty. Complicated deformation 
was mostly limited in the plateau region to zones of diverse displacement between extended areas of little disturbance. The only sharp folds with which he had to do occurred in these narrow zones. He suggested that flexing of strata was probably a deep-seated process, while faulting was a more superficial one. As in his discussion of the problem of antecedents, stated above, so through all his writings, he strongly supported the then growing idea that, quote, upheaval was not marked by a great convulsion for the lifting of the rocks in the Uintas was so slow that the rains removed the sandstones almost as fast as they came up, End quote. Following his systematic habit of mind, he grouped the mountainous reliefs of his region into two great classes. Some were composed of sedimentary strata and others of extravasated materials. He then divided these classes into a number of types according to details of structure and subdivided them still further according to the work of erosion upon them. The Appalachians were the only mountains here mentioned outside of his own field. The names given to his types were usually taken from local examples although in certain cases similar structures had long been well known in other fields. His reason for thus passing over the earlier work of others elsewhere was evidently that he wished simply to classify the phenomena that he had himself observed. It was perhaps by reason of the habit of reducing his facts to schematic arrangement that he gave an oversimplified account of the basin ranges. He did not explicitly announce that the pre-faulting mass in the Great Basin was of complicated structure and possibly of irregular surface. He indeed tacitly implied a horizontal structure and plane surface when he wrote, quote, When the blocks into which a district of country has been broken by faults are greatly tilted so that the strata dip at high angles, the uplifted edges of such blocks often form long mountain ridges. Many of the ridge-like mountains of the Basin Province have this structure. Such a ridge is composed of monoclinal strata, the one side presenting a bold, escarped front, the other a more gently sloped back, conforming to a greater or less degree with the dip. End quote. Uinta Mountains, page 16. It is possible that the failure of later observers to find simple monoclinal structures and forms in the basin ranges corresponding to this simple description is in part responsible for the misunderstandings that have arisen regarding the origin of the ranges. In another connection, Powell's account of the basin ranges is more satisfactory, as will appear below. End of section 7. Section 8 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 8 Physiographic Work. Powell's contribution to the discussion of erosional processes and their effect in the development of landforms was of fully as great value as his more strictly geological studies, and certainly exerted a marked influence on the work of later students of physiographic problems. It is not too much to say that in this division of his studies he, with his able collaborators, laid the foundations of what may fairly be called the American School of Geomorphology, now eagerly embraced by modern physiographers everywhere, and that he thus contributed immensely to the awakening and the advance of the sluggish old science of geography. It is worth pointing out that a physiographic turn was given to Powell's work, not so much from his own intentional preference or selection, but from the abundant and open opportunity for physiographic study in a semi-arid region. For, in common with nearly all the early geological explorers of the West, Powell was led by his environment to give much attention to surface forms. He could not fail to see their intimate relation to internal structure, 
so wonderfully displayed by reason of the scantiness or absence of vegetation. He therefore inevitably described the relief of his region by explaining it, and his explanation was presented in terms of structural masses raised by internal diastrophic forces and worked on upon by external destructive forces. He emphasized internal or geological structure as the prime basis for the classification of landforms and adopted as the guide to their secondary grouping the erosion of what he called concomitant or, as would now be said, sequential minor forms. He did not explicitly make the next step of systematically describing the stages in the progress of erosion during its work upon uplifted masses, but it must be a careless reader who does not repeatedly find this principle implied in a careful study of Powell's writings. At this time, as well as later, Powell had the great advantage of discussing his problems with a younger investigator of the Cordilleran region, whose sound views probably had a larger influence in shaping his seniors' opinions than will ever be directly known. As to the action of erosional processes, Powell's reports abound in quotable statements, of which the following are good examples. Quote, Erosion is not greatly promoted by increased rainfall. With greater rainfall, we have greater power, but a lesser utilization of the power. With lesser rainfall, we have lesser power, but greater utilization. And in these varying conditions, just where maximum degradation is found, I am not able to state. End quote. Quote, I have many times witnessed the action of a storm in an arid region where the disintegrated rocks were unprotected by forests, shrubbery, or turf, and as often have I been impressed with the wonderful power of the infrequent storm to gather up and carry away the land, as compared with the frequent storm in the prairie or forest of a land more richly clad. You into paper, page 188. See also Colorado River, 171. Attention to stream action naturally led to an attempt to classify streams and valleys. Two classifications were proposed. The first was based on the relation of streams to the strata that they traversed. Several types were admirably illustrated in ideal figures drawn by Holmes, and each type was given a name of Greek origin, as cataclinal, diaclinal, and so on. But these names have not come into general use, perhaps because they express only an empirical relation. The second classification of streams and valleys was in terms of their origin. The three kinds here recognized were given names of Latin derivation, antecedent, consequent, and superimposed last two kinds having been recognized but not named by Marvine, from whom Powell quotes, and these names have come into general use among modern physiographers. River behavior was discussed with much originality, and reasonable meaning was given to features that had previously been stated empirically. For example, quote, In the Colorado River, with very few exceptions, all the falls and rapids which beset its course through the great canyons are caused by dams of boulders made by side streams having great declivity. End quote. You went to paper 193. Regarding Platte River on the plains, it is luminously stated, quote, The beds through which the river runs are incoherent, and although the river has as great a fall as the Colorado through the plateaus, and although the climatic conditions are essentially the same, yet the former runs in a broad sheet scarcely below the level of the plain, while the latter runs in a narrow groove at profound depths below the general surface. End quote. Uinta, 194. The nature and amount of river load and the manner of its transportation are carefully considered. The load, quote, does not float on the water, 
but behaves as an integral part of it, and with it obeys the laws of hydrodynamics. End quote. The principles here announced were afterwards developed with greater fullness in an address before the National Academy of Sciences under the title of The Laws of Hydraulic Degradation, with the object of mentioning the principal efficient methods of controlling rivers in their floodplain reaches. And here Powell's indifference to precedent is shown again, for although the problem and the technique of river control had been abundantly discussed, and successfully practiced in Europe, Powell's published paper, Science, 12, 1888, pages 229 to 233, does not contain a single citation. As a correlative of the transportation of load by stream, its deposition was also considered, and a good beginning made toward recognizing the great importance of fluviatile deposits in the case of an extensive conglomerate. Uinta, 170. In connection with the transportation of large boulders from mountains by storm floods, a curious suggestion is made, Colorado River, page 208, regarding a possible similar interpretation of parts of the drift in the upper Mississippi Valley, which Powell had studied while he was a professor in Illinois. End of section 8. Section 9 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 9 Base Level of Erosion. Among all Powell's many generalizations, None has been more broadly applied than his conception of the base level, now better printed as a single word, base level, of erosion. He wrote, quote, We may consider the level of the sea to be a grand base level, below which the dry lands cannot be eroded. But we may also have, for local or temporary purposes, other base levels of erosion, which are the levels of the beds, of the principal streams which carry away the products of erosion. What I have called the base level would, in fact, be an imaginary surface, inclining slightly in all its parts toward the lower end of the principal stream draining the area through which the level is supposed to extend, or having the inclination of its parts varied in direction as determined by tributary streams." End quote. Where a stream crosses a series of rocks in its course, some of which are hard and others soft, the harder rocks form a series of temporary dams, and thus we may have a series of base levels of erosion. Colorado River Paper 203 It is to be noted that base level as thus defined seems to have two meanings. One meaning is very simple. It is simply the level of the sea extending in imagination under the lands. The other is much more complicated. It is an imaginary, undulating, and inclined surface passing through a river and its tributaries, but passing beneath the intervening land surfaces. And as thus defined, base level must be conceived with difficulty because of the vagueness as to the stage of river development when it is first to be applied because of the irregularity of its form, and because of its slow changes as the controlling streamlines are worn down to gentler slopes. Naturally enough, the more complicated meaning has been little used. The simpler meaning now prevails, under which base level may be concisely defined as the level base with respect to which river erosion is performed, determined either by sea level, in the most general case, or by a rock sill or lake surface or basin floor in various special cases. The idea thus presented is discoverable, provided the reader is already acquainted with it, as an implied factor of various explicit statements in the writings of certain earlier authors. But Powell makes it wholly explicit and indeed sets it forth in a very striking and appealing manner. 
Moreover, he gave its leading element a handy name, as he did in the case of antecedent rivers, with the result of rapidly promoting a clear and general understanding of a principle of prime importance in the rational study of land forms. Simple as the principle here involved really is, the explicit announcement marks an era in rational physiography. A second step of great importance followed from the first, as already intimated. The massive structures on which erosional processes operate having been conceived, the erosional processes themselves having been analyzed, and the base level with respect to which they work having been recognized, the successive steps in the progress of their work naturally became the subject of study. Powell clearly saw that mountain forms are not the result of disorderly and individual uplift, but of erosion. Quote, the mountains were not thrust up as peaks, but a great block was slowly lifted, and from this the mountains were carved by the clouds, patient artists, who take what time may be necessary for their work. We speak of mountains forming clouds about their tops. The clouds have formed the mountains. End quote. Colorado River 154. This had been recognized by others, but Powell went further. Quote, the first work of rains and rivers is to cut channels and divide the country into hills, and perhaps mountains, by many meandering grooves or watercourses, and when these have reached their local base levels, under the existing conditions, the hills are washed down, but not entirely carried away. Colorado River 204. That is, a lowland of small relief will in time be produced by the erosion of rain and rivers. Previous to Powell, no one had ventured in the theory of land carving by rain and rivers to go beyond what would today be called a late mature stage in the cycle of erosion, namely, the production of valleys between hills or mountains unless one goes back to the brief generalization of the German philosopher Kant, who a century earlier had recognized that the action of rain and streams must slowly wear down all highlands and rob the earth's surface of its inequalities, or to the broad principle of the Scotch geologist Playfair, who a little later explained that the earth must tend gradually to become a spheroid of rotation by the external action of erosional forces, whatever its original form had been. But Powell is much more thoroughgoing and definite than any of his predecessors. He states in his second report, after recognizing the rapid wearing down of highlands, quote, The degradation of the last few inches of a broad area of land above the level of the sea would require a longer time than all the thousands of feet which might have been above it, so far as this degradation depends on mechanical processes. But here the disintegration by solution and the transportation of the material by the agency of fluidity come in to assist the slow processes of mechanical degradation and finally perform the chief part of the task. Uinta 196. This passage is of special interest as being the most explicit statement made by Powell regarding the general possibility that normal erosional processes, working on a landmass long undisturbed, will ultimately reduce the whole surface to a lowland but little above sea level. His full understanding of the problem is shown when he thus points out the contrast between what would now be called the rapid changes of the youthful stage early in a cycle of erosion and the extreme deliberation of advanced old age at the end of the cycle. End of section 9section 10 of biographical memoir of john wesley powell 1834 to 1902 by william morris davis this librivox recording is in the public domain section 10 planation 
these general results were not left without practical application. The great plains of erosion, revealed by the superb unconformities in the bottom of the Grand Canyon of the Colorado in northern Arizona, were evidently regarded as the result of persistent erosion by rain and rivers during prolonged still stands of the region in ancient geological periods. But the phraseology adopted for the peroration in which the history of these buried lands is set forth must leave the uninformed reader in some doubt as to the precise nature of the facts and inferences there presented. A simpler statement is given for the plateau-like highlands of crystalline schists flanked by upturned sedimentaries in the Colorado Front Range, which has made a, quote, deep impression on Powell when he crossed them in his first western journey in 1867. He afterward recalls that he had then, quote, dimly conjectured that tens of thousands of feet had been eroded from some of the ranges, and that the table or plateau-like character of the ranges was due to some epoch of this later denudation of the ranges when they were planed down to a common level. Such a planing down occurs when the channels of the eroding streams remain for a great length of time at a general base level. End quote. You went to page 27. It would thus appear that the first observer to recognize this fundamental process in the origin of the front range of the Rocky Mountains was not Marvine, to whom it has elsewhere been credited, but Powell. True, he does not explicitly state that the plain down surface of the front range was afterward broadly uplifted to its present highland altitude in order to excite its streams to erode the gorges by which it is now dissected, but no one who reads his reports can doubt that he understood the uplift as clearly as the planing down. Following the principles so well and so early applied in Colorado, he afterward perceived that the ranges of the Great Basin, though composed of Ezoic and Paleozoic rocks, are mountains of very late upheaval, and that before upheaval their region was, quote, a comparatively low plain, constituting a general base level of erosion, to which that region had been denuded in Mesozoic and early tertiary time, when it was an area of dry land. End quote. He was thus led to say, quote, Mountains cannot long remain as mountains. They are ephemeral topographic forms. Geologically, all existing mountains are recent. The ancient mountains are gone. I can well recall the exclamatory vigor that Powell gave to a statement at a scientific meeting in 1884 and the emphasis that he added with rapid gestures of his empty sleeve. He said, quote, If the Adirondacks had been uplifted in Cambrian time, as was then generally supposed, they would have been worn down over and over again. The discussion of cliffs of displacement and cliffs of erosion in the Colorado River Report is an excellent example of Powell's deductive presentation evidently based upon observed examples, but systematically extended beyond their reach and admirably illustrated by a series of block diagrams by Holmes. The ideal types thus presented are shown in far greater distinctness than could be reached in any direct view of actual examples. It is well said that, quote, the cliffs of erosion are very irregular in direction, but somewhat constant in vertical outline, and the cliffs of displacement are somewhat regular in direction, but very inconsistent in vertical outline. End quote. This sentence may indeed be taken as one of the best examples of Powell's power in condensed verbal exposition. The migration of divides and the associated beheading of consequent streams during the retreat of cliffs of erosion is recognized, but the principle here involved was not developed to its more general application. End of section 10.
Section 11 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 11 Physiographic Essays. It is in the pages on the land forms of the Plateau Province that one finds some of Powell's best physiographic presentation, much better than in two later essays on physiographic processes and physiographic features, which he contributed to the series of National Geographic Monographs in 1895. These monographs were intended for school teachers of physical geography, who were then, as they are still, in too large a proportion very imperfectly trained in their science, and who therefore needed, as they still need, only elementary essays, presenting specific examples in simple language. Whatever Powell's earlier experience in teaching school may have contributed to his style of presentation, his later experience as leader of exploring expeditions and as organizer and director of large scientific bureaus did not adapt it to the needs of the readers here appealed to. The simple style in which cliffs and canyons are described in the Colorado River Report is replaced in these two essays by an elaborate, sometimes an extravagant, manner of statement little suited to school teachers. They are literal readers and must have been mystified by such sentences as, quote, The purple cloud is painted with dust and the sapphire sky is adamant on wings. Or, with the revolving moon, the tides sweep back and forth across the surface of the sea and alternately lash the shores with their crested waves. End quote. And it was certainly disappointing to those who had labored to introduce the principles of uniformitarian geology into geography to find the authority of Powell back of a statement telling, quote, how fire, earthquake, and flood have been involved in fashioning the land and sea. End quote. The small attention given to marine processes in Powell's official reports, written in the environment of a broad continental interior, was natural enough, but the scanty systematic treatment that these processes received in comparison with the attention given to rain and rivers in the essay on physiographic processes was as little appropriate as the insufficient discussion of river work in the exaggerated consideration of marine processes by certain earlier transatlantic writers of a more insular environment. The third essay of this series, on the physiographic regions of the United States, is better than the other two. The subdivisions of our country into provinces, as they are presented, has been often used by later writers, and must in its larger features be permanently adopted, because it is based on underground structure as the prime element in physiographic classification, rather than on an empirical examination of surface features independent of their origin, such as had been accepted in earlier years when geographers and geologists hardly had a speaking acquaintance with one another. The correlation of structure and form in the plateau region had been admirably set forth in the Uinta report by means of a block diagram, facing page 14, which marked an immense advance over the black-bodied profiles then in common use, and even today, unhappily not extinct. The same report had clearly separated the basin ranges, the plateaus, and the Rocky Mountains. Quote, First, desert valleys between naked ridges. Second, high plateaus severed by profound gorges. And third, massive high mountains with shining snowfields. End quote. This is supplemented in the Physiographic Regions report by the statement that the Rocky Mountains terminate in northern New Mexico, where the basin ranges stretch far southeastward to meet the southwestern border of the Great Plains. Subordinate changes in Powell's boundaries and subdivisions may of course be made, as in the interpolation of the group of domed mountains in western North Carolina between the Piedmont Plateau and the Appalachian Ridges, 
or in the separation of the highlands of northern Minnesota and upper Michigan from the lake plains farther southeast. But in the main, the demarcation of the provinces here indicated in text and map constitutes a permanent advance in American physiography. How singular that a practiced observer, keen enough to see that the Rocky Mountains end southward in New Mexico, should not have, as a writer for teachers, moderated the hyperbolic peroration which in the last lines of this essay described the California coast ranges as a province, quote, where the balm of the tropics bathes the winter with verdure and boreal zones boon the summer with zephyrs, end quote. It was in the connection with the explanatory or rational description of landforms in terms of their past history as dependent on underground rock structure and external erosive processes that Powell ingeniously applied his analytical method in a reverse direction, as if confident that a good rule must work both ways, for he frequently inferred the past history of a district from its present form. The reading of past history from depositional records had long been a standard method in geology. Reading past history from erosional records was a novelty. This is well illustrated in his conclusion that while each basin range is but a small residuary fragment of the great inclined block from which it had been carved, yet when compared to the Kaibab or the Uinta, the erosion of the basin range ridges sinks into insignificance. Hence, we are forced to conclusion that the conditions for great erosion now found in the basin ranges have existed but for a short period. You into paper, pages 33-34. This principle has had wide application in later years. End of section 11. Section 12 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834-1902 by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 12. Lands of the Arid Region. Powell's large share in promoting a correct knowledge of the arid parts of the United States and their possible utilization will not be realized by readers today unless they recall the time when so much was said about taking the words Great American Desert off of the map. This name was, during a period of early exploration, recklessly extended over vast areas of the West, which are by no means completely desert. But as the frontier was pushed westward half a century ago, the restriction of the name was hardly less reckless than its extension. The existence of a desert was actually denied, although there certainly is a large space in the West and Southwest truly not altogether devoid of vegetation, but permanently desert in the economic sense, whatever its name. It was, of course, open to occupation in a limited manner, as nearly all deserts are. Settlers who advanced into the dry country soon recognized that certain small areas in nearly every part of it could be redeemed by irrigation, and that much larger areas were not so barren but that wandering herds of cattle could subsist on their scanty herbage, provided that water was not too distant. Thus the region began to have a better reputation than it deserved, and curiously enough, about coincident with the wave of rapid immigration into the pasturage area of the Great Plains in the 70s and 80s, there was a period of increasing rainfall in that subhumid region, which was taken by many, even by army officers who ought to have known better, to result from plowing the soil, laying rails, or stretching telegraph wires, and therefore regarded as a permanent improvement of climate. Farming was for a time successful, and this was enormously advertised. Thousands of settlers, accustomed to farming on the moist prairies of the Mississippi Valley, attempted in good faith to establish themselves on the drier plains, only to be driven away 
with bitter disappointment and heavy loss when a few years later a period of less rainfall caused the failure of their crops. The irrigated areas naturally had better fortune, especially the larger undertaking of the Mormons in Utah and of the Greeley district in Colorado. These advantageously located areas are permanent assets of immense value to the West, and much profit now comes from many similar but smaller areas. But even the greenest spots in the most barren wilderness were always called settlements and never oases. In various parts of the arid region, the latter name would have been quite as appropriate as it is in the Sahara, but its connotation of a surrounding desert was too manifest to make it acceptable. Powell told the truth about the dry country and advocated a comprehensive plan whereby its real values might be developed. It was at his suggestion that Congress appointed a commission to study the physical and economic conditions of the arid region, and he gave two years to this work. We have no narrative of his western journeys in this connection, but the results were published in a most important report on the lands of the arid regions of the United States in 1879, to which Gilbert, Dutton, and Thompson contributed chapters. Few reports have had a greater value in pointing out the direction of safe and sound progress. The first edition of 1,800 copies was soon exhausted, and a second edition of 5,000 was issued. The area treated was about four-tenths of that of the United States, and the report was the first comprehensive study of the kind issued in this country. Today, it is recognized as a classic treatise on the subject. Powell cautiously set the limit of successful agriculture without irrigation, the singular art of dry farming was then unknown, at the line of 20 inches of average annual rainfall and showed the danger that farming must run from frequent droughts east of this line in that belt of the Great Plains trending north and south, which lies between the rainfall lines of 20 and 28 inches, and which he first called subarid. But the name subarid was later, on suggestions received in Washington, changed to subhumid as a less unpleasant term. He recognized an increasing stream supply during a decade previous to the preparation of his report, but instead of explaining it, as many have done, by an increase of rainfall, he ascribed it to an increased runoff due to artificial changes in the land surface. It may be noted in passing that the term runoff, now in general use, was invented by Powell. His correlated term fly-off, for rainfall that is lost by evaporation, has not been adopted. He scouted the idea that any operations of man can have brought about increased precipitation, but added, quote, if it be true that increase of the water supply is due to increase in precipitation, as many have supposed, the fact is not cheering to the agriculturist of the arid region. Usually such changes go in cycles, and the opposite or compensating change may reasonably be anticipated. For if the increase of stream results from an increase of rainfall, we shall have to expect a speedy return to extreme aridity in which case a large portion of the agricultural industries of the country, now growing up, would be destroyed. Page 91. Powell plainly stated that only a small fraction of the arid lands was available for agriculture, and pointed out that the redemption of the areas that could be irrigated would involve difficult engineering problems far too large for individual farmers, and possible only through cooperative labor controlled by carefully considered legislation. He saw, further, that when all this should be accomplished, only a small portion of the arid region could be cultivated. These principles are well enough understood now, after a generation of experience, but they were novelties when published, and served as needed corrections of exaggerated stories than current. The report on the arid region proposed a five-fold classification of the western public lands, 
not based on the traditions of the East, but on the facts and conditions of the West. The five classes were named mineral, coal, irrigable, pasturage, and timber lands. With mineral lands, the report had nothing to do. The abundance and importance of lignite coals was briefly stated. They were, indeed, regarded as inexhaustible by any population which the country can support for any length of time that human prevision can contemplate. It was recommended that their area should be determined by a thorough geological survey. The areas classified as timber lands were chiefly the higher plateaus and mountains, which have practically no value aside from their forests. But it was explicitly stated that these areas were by no means wholly occupied by standing timber because of the terrible devastation by forest fires. Emphatic warning was given of this danger in the arid region. Most of the fires were ascribed to intentional burning by Indians, who, displaced from lower lands by the advance of white settlers and impelled to hunt fur-bearing animals for trade, deliberately set fire to the forest for the purpose of driving the game. Therefore, the Indians should be removed from the forested areas. The burning of forest in the highlands of the arid region has been on a scale so vast that the amount taken from the lands for industrial purposes sinks by comparison into significance. Powell tells that he had, quote, witnessed two fires in Colorado, each of which destroyed more timber than all that used by the citizens of that state from its settlement to the present day, and at least three in Utah, each of which has destroyed more timber than that taken by the people of the territory since its occupation. Everywhere throughout the Rocky Mountain region, the explorer away from the beaten paths of civilization meets great areas of dead forests. In seasons of great drought, the mountaineer sees the heavens filled with clouds of smoke. If the fires are prevented, the renewal by annual growth will more than replace that taken by man. No limitation to the use of the forest need be made. End quote. Page 17. Quote, Once protected from fires, the forest will increase and extend in value. This protection, though sure to come at last, will be tardy. End quote. It is interesting to note in this connection Powell's unqualified statement that fire is the immediate cause of the lack of timber on the prairies, and the emphasis that he gave to the occurrence of large burned areas in the East at the time of the discovery of America. He wrote several years later, quote, When the lands in the East were plowed, the fires were stopped, and vast regions that were prairies at that time are now forest-clad. Today, 1895, the forests of the United States are somewhat more extensive than they were at the landing of Columbus. National Geographic Monograph 71. In classifying all the lands between the highland timber areas and the lowland irrigable areas as pasturage lands, Powell did not overlook that certain districts are really deserts, too low for timber, out of reach of irrigation, and too dry for pasture. He wrote, In very low altitudes and latitudes, the grasses are so scant as to be of no value. Here, the true deserts are found. These conditions obtain in southern California, southern Nevada, southern Arizona, and southern New Mexico, where broad stretches of land are naked of vegetation, but in ascending to the higher lands, the grass steadily increases. End quote. The threefold classification, therefore, seems to have been for the sake of simplicity. Surely the confident assertion of value in the larger part of the arid region as a cattle raising country has been abundantly verified. The sparse growth of herbage on the grazing lands demanded large farm units. Powell advised that the minimum be set at four square miles, or 2,560 acres. He further advocated a somewhat ideal plan of settlement, in which the ranchmen's homes should be grouped around irrigable tracts 
so as to secure the benefits of social organization, and, as he thought that fences would not be used, he inferred that the herds must roam freely under local communal regulations. Practice has not always verified these anticipations. Roaming herds have been common on open public lands. But large areas of private lands are now enclosed by long fences of barbed wire, hardly known in 1879. Work for a generation was laid out in Powell's far-sighted treatment of the irrigable districts he showed that their total area must be small in relation to the vast extent of the whole arid region. He studied the amount of water that an irrigated farm would need and concluded that a continuous flow of one cubic foot of water per second would serve from 80 to 100 acres. He advised a better construction of canals to prevent the excessive waste that was then almost universal. Streams must be gauged to determine how much land they can serve. Reservoir sites must be reserved against the time when they would be needed to save the winter runoff. But the most significant sentences in this part of his remarkable report concern the danger of monopoly in the ownership of water. And in this respect, Powell showed himself a pioneer conservationist. He doubted the wisdom of too rapid enterprise prompted by the intense desire for speedy development on the part of first-comers, who give little heed to, quote, philosophic considerations of political economy or to the ultimate condition of affairs in which their present enterprises will result, if, in the eagerness for present development, a land and water system shall grow up in which the practical control of agriculture shall fall into the hands of water companies evils will result therefrom that generations may not be able to correct, and the very men who are now lauded as benefactors to the country will, in the ungovernable reaction which is sure to come, be denounced as oppressors of the people. The right to use water should inhere in the land to be irrigated, and water rights should go with land titles. End quote, page 41. Quote, the ancient principles of common law applying to the use of natural streams, so wise and equitable in a humid region, would, if applied to the arid region, practically prohibit the growth of its most important industries, because the water there has no value in its natural channel. Water rights are being practically severed from the natural channels of the streams, and this must be done. In the change, it is to be feared that water rights will in many cases be separated from all land rights as the system is now forming. If this fear is not groundless to the extent that such a separation is secured, water will become a property independent of the land, and this property will be gradually absorbed by a few. Monopolies of water will be secured, and the whole agriculture of the arid country will be tributary thereto, a condition of affairs which an American citizen having in view the interest of the largest number of people cannot contemplate with favor. The right to the water should inhere in the land where it is used, not to the individual or company constructing the canals by which it is used. End quote. Page 42 and 43. A natural result of this invaluable report was Powell's appointment as a member of the Public Land Commission by the Senate and House of Representatives in 1879. The enormous import of Powell's conclusions may be understood when it is recognized how many of them have been given practical application on a large scale and more or less modified form by governmental bureaus. Land classification and stream measurement are now important functions of our National Geological Survey. The same survey for a time reported upon reservoir sites and upon the area and value of forest, but the latter duty has been given to the Forestry Bureau, under which the greatest efforts are made to secure adequate protection from forest fires. 
the difficulty which makes this protection tardy as powell predicted it would be not being found in mere problems of administration but altogether in the failure of a negligent congress to provide adequate funds for the relatively moderate expense involved the survey of reservoir sites and the large engineering works foreseen as necessary for the full development of the possibilities of irrigation are now conducted on an enormous scale by the reclamation service an outgrowth of a branch of the geological survey and one of the best and most beneficent of our governmental undertakings the introduction of electric power plants advantageously installed in connection with irrigation dams and of immense economic value in using a natural supply of energy that would otherwise be wasted have only increased the importance of everything that powell said regarding the necessity of guarding our water supplies from monopolistic control and conserving them for the common good when all this is appreciated powell must come to be regarded as one of our great national benefactors the opinions of two highly competent judges may here be quoted. Gilbert wrote, in effect, that Powell's report on the lands of the arid regions set forth with marvelous insight the conditions by which the problem of their best utilization is surrounded. His views were discredited at the time, because he announced that only a small percentage of the Far West can ever be reclaimed for agriculture. The report raised a storm of indignation because it characterized as semi-arid the middle belt of the plains toward which settlement was then tending, yet today it is recognized as a classic treatise. Van Hys wrote in a similar vein, telling how Powell gave the benefit of his knowledge of the arid regions to the legislators of the nation. He saw that the arid lands were a possible great resource to the country, but an exceptional resource, which could not be wisely handled into the common law as it had been developed in humid regions. He saw that there was no danger of monopoly of land, but that the real danger was the monopoly of water, that he who controlled the water was the master of the land. Consequently, he proposed broad and statesmanlike legislation for the division of the lands of the West, which are not mining lands, into several classes, and advised that these lands should be controlled by special laws. The suggestions which Powell made regarding the economic problems here treated have been in large measure incorporated into statutes. The effort for reform was complicated by conflicting interests and at times it was a disheartening struggle. But it is a pleasure to record that during the Major's last sickness, he was able to know of the passage of the Reclamation Act, the most important triumph of the arid lands agitation. End of section 12. Section 13 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell. 1834 to 1902 by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 13. The Geological Survey. In no case was Powell's capacity to turn the course of events more strikingly shown than in the organization of our present National Geological Survey. Through the 70s, the existence of several official yet independent surveys of the Western country under different departments of the government resulted in scandalous rivalries and animosities. Powell, at the head of one of these organizations, strove to reach an adjustment by mutual consent. Failing in this, he boldly advocated complete reorganization. He had advised the consolidation of the several rival surveys in 1874, and it appears to have been at his suggestion that Congress, in June 1878, called upon the National Academy of Sciences, of which he was then not a member, for advice. A committee of the Academy reported in November a plan which had been, in its main features, formulated and advocated by Powell, involving the abolition of the rival surveys 
and the creation of two separate bureaus, one an enlargement of the Coast Survey under the title of Coast and Interior Survey for geodetic and topographic measuration, the other a geological survey for studies of structure and resources, not of the United States, but of the public domain. All matters concerning the disposition and sale of public lands being left to the general land office. The present generation should be reminded that, during the discussion of the recommended organization, strong pressure was brought to bear upon Congress in favor of placing all topographic surveys in charge of the Engineer Corps of the Army, and European precedents for this plan were abundantly cited. But it was urged, on the other hand, that our needs would be better served by civil rather than military engineers, because the uses of our public domain would be much more largely in the way of peaceful settlement than of warlike campaigns. On this point, as on many others, Powell's opinion seems to have had weight. His view of the entire problem was presented in a letter as a supplement to the report of the Committee of the National Academy. And this letter, the Honorable Abram S. Hewitt, then a leading member of the House of Representatives, urged all his colleagues to read, because the whole subject of reorganization of the surveys was there so much better treated than any gentleman on the floor can hope to do. The Geological Survey was established by an act of Congress on March 3, 1879. Although its work was, as noted above, limited to the public domain, the name United States Geological Survey was at once assumed. A Bureau of Ethnology was created at about the same time, but the duties of the Coast Survey and the Land Office were not changed, and no special provision was made for a topographic survey. It is significant that the law establishing the Geological Survey mentioned the classification of the public lands before the examination of their geological structure. It is significant also that, on account of Powell's active share in bringing the new survey into existence, he refused to be considered a candidate for its directorship. He was appointed instead to the directorship of the Bureau of Ethnology, and Clarence King, previously chief of the famous 40th Parallel Survey, was appointed director of the new geological survey in March 1879. He resigned two years later on the ground of preferring personal investigation to administration. Powell, believing his duty in the Bureau of Ethnology to be permanent and engrossing, had given up all thought of continuing his work as a geologist. But he was appointed director of the geological survey after King's resignation, while still retaining his other directorship, and returned to geological work in March 1881 with vigor and enthusiasm. Many of the activities of the Geological Survey were then, for over ten years, so characteristic of Powell's method of work that an account of them deserves an important place in a memoir of his life. The breadth of the organization reflected his native interest in comprehensive schemes and his unusual capacity in developing them. King had already secured the services of a number of geologists from the several surveys that had been disbanded, and Powell brought in still others. Thus a good volume of inherited work was quickly brought forward for publication. He had in Gilbert a wise advisor on scientific problems, and in McChesney an able aid in all financial matters. The enlistment of many professors of geology in colleges all over the country to contribute reports on subjects that they had previously studied independently showed the broadly inclusive spirit in which the development of the survey was conceived. Thus, the director secured the personal interest of many widely distributed experts in the maintenance of the survey, and at the same time brought together much accumulated knowledge in local or special fields. This was a wise step at the beginning, when the supply of well-trained young American geologists was small, but such a method of securing field geologists was outgrown half a generation later 
when the students of the professors of the earlier time had in good number become expert members of the survey, practiced in methods adapted to its special needs, and not distracted from its work by duties to other institutions. The standard of technical preparation expected of members in various branches of geology and topography was at the outset necessarily low, for there had been no demand to excite a well-trained supply, and the pressure of congressmen to secure places for their relatives and friends did not tend to raise the standard. But it was raised as rapidly as possible, and the survey thus reacted most helpfully on the development of the geological departments in our universities. In the meantime, if senators' nephews sometimes gained positions as camp assistants or broad men, they were seldom capable of geological work, and in any case, Powell squarely accepted all responsibility as to the character of his appointees. He wrote in the sixth annual report, quote, If then improper persons are employed, it is wholly the director's fault. End quote. A liberal policy was adopted regarding the exchange of the survey publications with productive geologists, whereby many an isolated worker was kept in touch with the progress of the great national undertaking. The early reports and monographs were, moreover, of exceptional interest and immediately commanded the admiration of the whole geological world. A sound method of business administration was developed. Powell's detail account of it before a joint commission of Congress in 1885 made a most favorable impression on the majority of the senators and representatives who heard him. A full statement of this matter is given in systematic form in the eighth annual report, and a briefer statement of the organization of the survey was communicated to the National Academy in 1884 and printed in the American Journal of Science for February 1885. But it is the original report of the Joint Commission, an exceptionally interesting public document, published in the form of questions and answers usual in such cases, that best shows Powell's close familiarity with all details of survey work and his remarkable competence in setting forth methods of administration. Those who were then members of the survey will remember how nearly everyone was for a time pressed into the work of summarizing the reports of foreign topographical and geological surveys so that the director should have precise and detailed information in his hands. His testimony illustrates how ably he used the varied material thus placed at his disposal. Powell's third report, the fourth annual report of the survey, announces that the Congressional Act making appropriations for the survey for 1882 and 83 required the preparation of a geologic map of the United States. Thus, for the first time, explicit authority was given for extending the operations of the survey over the whole country, and therewith implicit authority for the preparation of a topographic map as the necessary basis of the geologic map. Who can say how far Powell himself suggested the use of these highly significant words? Reports on topographic work were thereafter placed at the head of the list of administrative statements in the annual reports issued by Powell. The failure of Congress to establish three years before an independent topographic bureau was thus repaired, and by a curious combination of circumstances, Powell found himself in charge of both classes of work, topographic and geologic, that had been assigned to separate bureaus in the recommendation of the National Academy, and of the work in the Bureau of Ethnology as well. About six years later, 1888, the conduct of an irrigation survey was also placed under his charge. Never before or since has so large and so varied a scientific responsibility been concentrated in the hands of a single governmental official at Washington. End of section 13. Section 14 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 
1834-1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 14. Topographical Map. The sheets of the topographical map surveyed, drawn, and printed by the survey have been immensely serviceable. Indeed, no publications of the survey have had up to the present date a greater general usefulness than this map, which under Powell's strong initiative was undertaken for the whole country. Scientists of the younger generation, who are now profiting from the large supply of good maps available for their uses, can hardly appreciate the rarity of cartographic material regarding nearly every part of our country, the coast and the lake shores excepted, thirty years ago. The change from geographic barbarism of that earlier day to the relative civilization of the present time is due more to Powell than to any other one man. And in accomplishing this change, Gannett was for many years his right hand. The plan for the topographic survey of the United States is set forth in the 6th and 7th annual reports. Quote, the map should be so simple that it can be used by all people of intelligence. The uses for topographic maps are very many, but there is no demand more exacting than that made by the geologist, and if properly made to meet his wants, they will subserve the purposes of the civil engineer and the agriculturalist, the military engineer and the naturalist. End quote. Map making in Europe had been largely in the hands of military engineers, as had been intimated above, and maps had been there prepared chiefly for military or cadastral purposes. Our needs are neither military nor cadastral, but civil in general and our methods must meet our needs. Quote, no nation had yet undertaken to execute a work of this character over a region of such magnitude. It has therefore been deemed of prime importance that the survey should be conducted with utmost regard to economy. End quote. Relief had usually been represented by shading or by hachures. Shading is too vague. Hachures are too expensive. Contours are definite and not over costly. Hence, contour maps were determined upon. Cooperative work with states, first undertaken in 1884 with Massachusetts, has since then been greatly extended. Singularly enough, no provision was made at first for the sale of the topographic sheets to the public. But when this was allowed, the price did not include any part of the cost of production apart from paper and printing. A wide distribution was thus secured. The same wise method was early applied in determining the price asked for survey reports and later for geologic folios. The plans as outlined at the beginning of this great topographic work were admirable. The difficulty of executing them was great. Liberal sums were available for topographic surveying, but for a time it was impossible to find trained topographers in the desired number. Hence, many insufficiently trained men had to be employed, and their training came in the field. The pressure for the rapid production of maps at moderate cost over large areas led to hasty work insufficiently inspected. Hence, the published maps were not always correct to scale of publication. In some cases, the dangerous practice was permitted of redrawing in new form the maps produced by previous surveys, and as a result, certain sheets of deplorable inaccuracy were issued. Some of these exhibit features that are hardly recognizable on the excellent maps of later date for the same districts. Nevertheless, Progress toward greater accuracy was rapid afterward, when better methods were introduced and greater cost was allowed per square mile. And it may now be seriously questioned whether the large number of excellent maps annually issued at present could have been so soon reached in any way, but by plunging in boldly and rapidly, instead of slowly and accurately at the beginning. Certain it is, that the revelation of geographical matters of fact regarding large areas of our country, 
as portrayed on the sheets issued during the last ten or fifteen years, is of immense service to us all today. And this service must be counted as a consequence of Powell's marvelous initiative. End of section 14.